Coming up. In the first of ICT's Politics 101, we're getting a lesson in caucuses and how they affect presidential elections. We learn about traditional Hawaiian kapa making, and we remember Yakima Nation elder and leader Ted Strong. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines, on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT Newscast with Alia Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. Around the country, public health officials say they are alarmed by an increase in cases of syphilis in American Indian and Alaska Native people. Shirley Snavy has more for us. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease. It can occur as a rash and may go away on its own, but the person still can infect others. Cases in Indian country are on the rise, particularly in South Dakota. Cherokee Dr. Megan O'Connell is from the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Health Board. She said there is one piece of good news about syphilis. It's curable for most people with a single shot of penicillin. In terms of the impact it has on babies, though, I think it's very concerning um, on the impact it's having on Native infants because there are so many Native babies that are being born with congenital syphilis, and it can have such dire effects. Syphilis has the ability to transfer from mother to baby in the womb, and it can cause a miscarriage or death. Dr. O'Connell stressed that testing is important. We turn now to South Dakota, where a tribal nation has banned the governor from its territory over comments made about migrants. Last week, Oglala Sioux President Frank Starr comes out, banned Governor Christy Nome from his nation. That's after Governor Nome said she wants to send razor wire and officers to Texas to deter migrants seeking to enter the United States. Many migrants are indigenous people who come in search of a better life, Starr comes out said. You are hereby banished from the homelands of the Oglala Sioux tribe, he wrote to the governor. Nome said she seeks improved tribal relations, adding, I stand ready to work with any of our state's tribes. A new report reveals the unmet needs of some Alaska Native villages. The Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium has released its assessment and recommendation in supporting Alaska tribal communities through climate change. The report identifies funding, resource distribution, and agency coordination for addressing environmental threats like erosion and flooding. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the state collaborated on the report, which includes representation from 11 tribal communities and seven organizations. According to ANTCH President and Yupik citizen Valerie Davidson, it's important to recognize tribes as leaders in climate adaptation. The report also calls for congressional action and offers a potential framework for combating similar challenges around the nation. A debt collection firm in Colorado is being penalized after charging Native Americans more than 500 percent in interest rates. Kansas-based company True Accord has reached a settlement with Colorado's attorney, attorney General's office and must pay half a million dollars for their illegal debt collection practices. True Accord had claimed their loans were subject to tribal law rather than Colorado law, leading to APR rates from 500 percent and even 900 percent. The state cites True Accord violated the Colorado Fair Debt Collection Act, which caps interest rates for consumer loans at 12 percent per year. The settlement money will be returned to affected tribal lenders from the Ute Mountain and Southern Ute tribes. Well, an Alaska Native author has won national honors for her debut novel. Inupiaq author Nasurak Rainey Hobson has won a Newbery Honor and an American Indian Youth Literature Award for her book, Eagle Drums. 
Eagle Drums is a young adult novel based on Inupiaq myths that tells a coming-of-age story celebrating unity in indigenous cultures. A Newbery Honor is a long-standing, distinguished prize for children's literature. Winning the award for her first novel, Hobson hopes the book will inspire other indigenous authors to overcome their fears of getting into publishing. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Twenty twenty four is a presidential election year, which means discussion around candidates and poll numbers rage on. ICT's political correspondent, Polly Danette Claw, reports our first in a new series called Politics One O One. First up, primary election versus caucus. What's the difference between the two and how do they affect our presidential elections? We have two processes for selecting our presidential nominee from each of the parties. I'm from New Mexico and we have a primary election. It did not occur to me that other states have a different way of selecting a party candidate for the general ballot in November. Cue the Iowa caucuses that kick off the 2024 election season. Why are the Iowa caucuses so important? In American politics, Iowa has come first. It has acted as that filter, which filters out much of the early nominees to see if they have legs to go to the rest of the country. There's many critiques, particularly on the Democratic side of the House here, um, because it's not democratic, demographically representative and because it has such low turnout, how could it be a good filter for the country? But what exactly are caucuses and how does the process work? The way that I like to explain it is letting folks know it's a community meeting. It's like a chapter house meeting uh, where folks will come together, though, and it's meant to have a really good camaraderie, talk about who they're going to elect in terms of candidates and, and about the issues, and also a little strategy if you try to get some people to your side, because during uh, this caucus, at the end, you still need to vote and you need to try to get, gather as many votes as you can for your candidate or your side or your issue. The allure of caucuses is community building. Coming together over burnt coffee and stale pastries to talk about the pros and cons of each candidate. Unfortunately, it comes with a whole host of issues, intended or not, that leads to lower participation. Just 15% of registered Republican voters participated this year. Those 110,000 participants chose the Republican candidate for 752,000 registered Republican voters. That is a large gap. So having early voting, being able to turn in your ballot for weeks and weeks over time uh, is a good thing. Uh, caucuses prohibit that ability. And so um, you have to show up on one day for a few hours and you have to be there. Um, and so in general, it's fairly undemocratic as like as a, as a system. A majority of states have a primary election where voters head to the ballot box to choose their party's candidate. There is often weeks of early voting and the option for mail-in ballots only Iowa, Nevada, North Dakota, and Wyoming have caucuses. Well, Nevada this year will have both a primary and a caucus. I know, very confusing. It's important to know the voting registration requirements and deadlines for the state you reside in. The official route is to go to the um, your state secretary of state. So if you type in your state, you know, California, um, and secretary of state, voting, it will pop up and it will take you through the process. It'll give you all of the rules. It'll have a polling place locator. It'll often allow you to register to vote um, if online voter registration is possible. If not, it'll show you how to do it. Um, that is one avenue to being able to get that information. The second um, is uh, I would recommend going to voteamerica.com. Um, and Vote America has all of this data that's built out and it's a little bit more user friendly for folks who are not as used to navigating government websites. Um, and it will allow you to register to vote online even if they don't allow it in the state and Vote America will help you through that process. In Washington, D.C., Polly Dineclaw for ICT News. Hotter summers, longer pollen seasons, and record rainfalls. These changing patterns are putting our health and the health of those we love at risk. So, communities around the country are taking steps to prepare. State, local, and tribal health officials are using the Building Resilience Against Climate Effects Framework developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, called BRACE for short. 
The five-step process is used to develop strategies and programs that help communities prepare a coordinated community response to the health effects of a changing climate. Step one is identifying what climate effects are relevant locally, how those might lead to new or expanded health threats, and who is most at risk. The next step is to calculate expected impacts on the local population, and then rank the severity of each threat. This is called projecting the disease burden. What it does is it helps health officials tackle the worst risks first. Step three is to identify ways the community can intervene to prevent or reduce health effects. For example, health officials who are expecting more high heat days might consider if it would be more effective to open community cooling centers or to collaborate on housing and development plans to protect vulnerable residents. Then in step four, health officials work with other community sectors to develop and implement their plan. For example, health officials may work with city planners to reduce the impact of urban heat islands or with broadcast meteorologists to alert people to prepare for extreme weather. Step five is evaluation. Health officials assess the success of their adaptation plans and gather lessons learned to apply for future activities. These five steps in the BRACE framework are designed to be flexible and responsive to local needs. Any community, whether urban, suburban, rural, or tribal, can use BRACE to prepare for the local health impacts of a changing climate. To learn more, visit cdc.gov forward slash climate and health. Indigenous arts across the world start with resources. The Hawaiian art of making kapa, which is cloth made from tree bark, is no different. Miley Andrade works with kapa from the ground up. Shirley Snavy has the story. It starts with the bark of the paper mulberry tree. Hawaiians call it wake. With a shift grant from the Native Arts and Culture Foundation, Miley Andrade is partnering with a nature preserve to grow it for kapa making. Polulu Aina is in the island. So I live in um, Kauai, which is an outer island. And so my practice here with the grant, we're doing the same thing that Holulu Aina is going to be doing, but the one in Kauai is going to be smaller and more private. The one in Holulu Aina will be open to the public because Honolulu is its base and um, access to more people. And it's tucked back in the valley, Kalihi Valley. And, you know, you could be in the city like in 10 minutes, but then when you go back into the valley, you're like in the country. And Holo Aina is run by Puni Jackson, who was one of my students at the university, who is now has an MFA in painting and drawing, but now runs this beautiful community center. I found the challenging part of practicing our culture is resources. And lots of people wanted to learn the skill, but before you can even get the skill, you need to have stuff to work from. And, um, and, and most of the things that we use in our culture to do practice our skill is it, isn't something you just go to a store and buy. So you have to grow it, you have to harvest it. And I'm trying to discourage um, my students from just going into the forest and just taking. You know, if you're a beginner, that's not probably the best practice. I think you should practice first and become more, um, prof you know, proficient in what you're doing before you can go to the forest. Hopefully, we want to be able to create a group on all the islands that we can just practice. And I'm not practicing kapa in a sense where I want to um, bring it back as an art form. We really want to practice and make pieces for ceremony. You know, there's a lot of artists just making pieces to sell and make money, which it's not a bad thing because you got to make a living at it. But for me, I feel that it's not a priority to do that. I think the priority is to be able to make pieces that can serve our community, our Hawaiian community in burials or in clothing for ceremony or for births or weddings, you know, the way traditionally these pieces were used. The, the extension of the traditional or traditional is a tricky word or our customary practices of kapa you know, today, what is, how do we take it into the future? And so it would be paper making, print making, books, you know, and how do we continue telling the stories for our younger students, you know, for the, for the next generation or the generation after. 
And that's sort of what I'm interested in. You know, how do we how do we not lose the Ike or the knowledge of our ancestors? Shirley Snavy, ICT News. Up Jij. I'll see you again. Up means again. Up is I'll see you again because there is no such thing as goodbye in the Passamaquoddy language. We go now to the Pacific Northwest, where Yakima Nation elder and leader Ted Strong has died at age 76. Considered a warrior for the tribes of his region, Strong was a passionate advocate for the melding of Western science and traditional ecological knowledge to benefit salmon. Over the weekend, the Columbia Intertribal Fish Commission, where Strong served as executive director from 1990 to 1999, announced his passing in a press release. The last time we spoke to Strong was in 2022 at the Reservation Economic Summit in Las Vegas, Nevada. Here is this conversation led by ICT's Mark Trahant. Most of our interviews are about programs or policies or things happening right now. This is not that. Today I'm talking to Ted Strong, and we're going to talk about an arc of history. It, it would be easy for us to talk about the last 40 years because we both watched it from a very uh, great perspective. But really, let's talk about the last 10 or 20,000 years. <laughs> let's start with that. Ted Strong. Thank you, and welcome to Native America. All the listeners and observers out there, when we began our trek on Earth, it was during what we pe people term as legendary times, when the earth, the sun, the stars, the moon, the fish, the animals, birds, they spoke. They spoke about the secrets of life. They spoke about the powers that came from nature. That became our lifelong vision. During our ancestral times, going back to the first humans, they began to learn about the earth, they learned about life. That developed the tribal ceremonials, which in turn gave us a sense of organization, discipline, and purpose. We roll all of that into goals, objectives in our business lives today. And that is something that enriches corporations. It enriches bureaus and governments, whether it's federal, tribal, state, or otherwise. And it gives the uh, purpose of uh, doing business with honesty, with justice. So the beginning of time to this time, it's an immense amount of time. The geological clock has only spun a few times around, but we're already facing things like endangered species. We're facing issues like disenrollment because of lack of blood quantum and hurtful things, diseases like alcohol, drug abuse, suicides. So it's turbulent times and we, we have to rely upon our, the strength and beauty and power of our culture to help us maintain some sense of balance. Mark Trahant asked Ted Strong to discuss a special relationship he had with former President Bill Clinton. Strong remembers a summit on forests in 1993 with President Clinton. He said out of a full day of discussion, Native people were only given three minutes to discuss what mattered to them. Everybody there spoke about policy, about monetary needs, but my ancestors and my boss has told me to talk about spiritual powers that were necessary for essentials of life. My three minutes of talk were about those things that are critical to make sure that we kept alive 
the cultural beauty. And the president said, I've never heard that kind of speech before. And he asked me if I would join his Council on Sustainable Development, which was balancing uh, equity, environment, and economy. And he said, there's a secret, there's a mystery, that a thread that binds those three. And we think Native America has some of the answers, some solutions for us. And I was asked, uh, and I participate for six years on that council. I'm curious how you go about telling young people these stories and how to get them excited about using cultural values as a success tool. You know, it takes an extraordinary amount of patience. It takes uh, an extraordinary amount of storytelling. One has to be artful to interest them because on the internet, on social media, they have thousands of interests that can lead them astray. It occupies their time before long, it occupies their mind, and it'll occupy their heart. You have to unravel some of that in order to get them to understand that there is this natural beauty as opposed to artificial intelligence. And it takes uh, them wanting to develop that interest. That comes from practice of cultural religion. When they study religion from a native point of view, it's not like a building structure that is church. Church is something that uh, emanates from the spirit of creation. Our stories of creation are fascinating. Our, our stories of creation are filled with wisdom. And they begin to understand that wisdom is different. It makes them stand out from all of the other peers that they may have. It gives them answers to substitutes for gang violence. It gives them a reason to live rather than think about committing suicide. It makes them understand that the proliferation of things like language, the preservation of natural foods, the preservation of the environment, all that comes from sustainability these are things that we begin teaching earlier and earlier. So we start uh, from the kindergarten, and there the kids are anxious to learn. They're easily led. When they get older and older, they become resistant. So it takes that patience and perseverance, and we've been able to do some of that. I like that, the idea of wisdom. Thank you so much for joining us today. Ted Strong. Thank you very much, um, Mark Crahet. Mark and I go back so many years, almost to the beginning of time, it seems like it. Business time. <laughs> Thank you. When I think about the reservation and my life there as a kid, it's a time and a place that I really yearn for because I spent that time with really formative people in my life, teaching me what it meant to be Navajo. As Native Americans, substantial rights under the Constitution and laws of this country were going unenforced. Those traumas show up in our elders throughout our lives, throughout our parents' lives. A lot of the history is still impacting us to this day. There's something really powerful that happens when you articulate an injustice. And at NARF, we do that on all fronts. The Native American Rights Fund is the oldest and largest nonprofit law firm. Fighting alongside our tribal communities to defend Native American rights. I see the difference that it makes with our Indian people. We are facing really challenging times. The right to vote has been under siege. Without voting, every other right in Indian country that matters falls. So it's really important to have NARF standing with our tribal people to define voting as part of the fight for tribal sovereignty. Anytime Native American voters are in a position to swing elections, that's when you see the most egregious violations of their voting rights. And so we responded to that moment. The Native American Voting Rights Practice Group arose with this rising anti-democratic movement that has been happening across America. The voting rights litigation that we do is tough. The facts are tough. 
They're very personal to our voting team, but our wins are big. And we win all the time. We have to be vigilant in terms of protecting our rights, just like we have these last 53 years. In order to make good on the promise of America, we have to make sure that every Native American can vote and have the ability to effectuate change in their communities. I think that's the way that we collectively move forward. The Native vote matters because it's important, because it makes change in all the states we work in. When our ballot box achieves justice for Native people, that's when we as a country can really feel faith in our institutions. This election year, NARF will be leading the fight to protect Native American voting rights in states across the country. Follow along as we tell our stories from reservations, communities, and on the front lines of democracy. Now is the moment. Join us. That is a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.